Welcome. This is uh, I'm Dr. Michael Rowain. This is another series from TOPKI, Training Osteopathic Primary Care Educators. This is a series of presentations that we're having to highlight unique things that may assist osteopathic educators in multiple settings. Today, the topic we're going to talk about is procedural teaching pearls in osteopathic man manipulative medicine. In the old days, it was we said beyond C1, do one, teach one, which many of us were trained in. So we go through some areas to looking at this. I do want to acknowledge that these slides were also helped develop from one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. John Jones, who is the chairperson of Osteopathic Principles and Practices at William Carey University College of Osteopathic Medicine. Well, kind of our goal today and objectives in that is to look at all the core concepts and su successfully teaching procedural skills. But we're looking at something uniquely. As osteopathic physicians, we're also trying to apply osteopathic concepts in using osteopathic manipulative treatment and looking at it in clinical settings. And how can we utilize that? I think hopefully we'll get some areas to kind of assist our teaching techniques to improve how we do that and to understand that and going through it. I think we look at history. You know, A.T. Still was a founder of osteopathic medicine. And when he founded the school himself, he, in 1892 in Kirksville, and died in 1917. He looked, you know, himself, when they looked historically, when it hit the turn of the century, a lot of, most of his students, you know, were only utilizing a few of his technique modalities. And they really weren't being taught as much as late as 1915. Now, some people mentioned that Still himself didn't want people to just be focused on his technique, but applying things themselves. But we can even see from our founder that sometimes the old see one, do one, teach one didn't keep perpetuating and going through things. Well, where are we at? In medical education, we start off didactic years and begin just learning themselves. And you tell people in the beginning, you know, what you expect them to learn. Now the whole process is, you know, how they're expected to learn themselves. And you want to look and you look at materials and everything that you're giving as an educator to help support that learning process. We're looking at developing and learners in action, learning it themselves. An area that learners are always asking us to do a better job with is evaluating them, giving them feedback, and knowing their expectation. That's where we have to be very clear of how we're going to test to make sure that they've reached that competency. Again, we look back at our learners, we're developing them as novices to develop basic skills, to become competent physicians, and move towards individuals who have expertise. And you want to test them to make sure that you're really, you know, they have kind of learned things. And they've also been told that they can be tested on. Learners don't want surprises. The challenge with osteopathic manipulative treatment and learning this is a psychomotor skill. And it's not the same as just learn these facts. People have got to honestly apply things to doing it. So when we look at that, we have got the cognitive level themselves, understanding the concepts, the effect of how they really enact those things and understand themselves, and psychomotor, how they're able to do themselves. So again, we're looking at knowledge, we're looking at attitude, we're looking at skills in those areas themselves. And that's how, if we bring from an osteopathic medical student all the way through residency, fellowship, we can be attending, going through that whole process, what we're doing. Many times we get caught up in the whole educational jargon all the time themselves. And, you know, we look themselves as, again, content knowledge. The move now is to really move people more to being process expert. How do we help people transverse, again, from novices to becoming competent, developing expertise in education, a dynamic education themselves? The challenge is that many of us have not been trained to think that way or be part of things themselves. And we're not familiar with some of those terms. And I'm going to just go through a few to give you a sampling of things we have to think about. They're also looking at criterion reference testing, norm reference, mastery test, high stake test. And understanding those concepts, I think, will make us more effective as educators. So let's take a look at norm, which is what most of us kind of brought into school with and trained with, and how it's moving more to a criterion reference test. So we think of things like norm, you know, it's kind of the ranking, did you do better than this other person? You know, here are the best people, here are the not people. It's kind of like, is it good, is it bad? You know, did you get, you know, the, the good people answer the questions, the people who didn't understand it, they missed it. You know, they're the good, they're the bad. So it became very much in that direction. To be competent and develop a clinician with expertise, we're looking at a whole different approach. 
it's not just good or bad, but also do they master? Do they understand that material? You know, when they answer questions, did they do that correctly in the process of that? You know, how do they get to that level achievement? You want to make sure that you will find ways that shows they really understand the material. And there's also standards. What do we expect someone to be a good physician and a good hospital physician, taking care of patients and looking at that rather than just knowing the answers? So when we're, we're looking at all those areas themselves, you know, again, these are, these are key things we're looking at. So when you look at this mastery test, um, you know, one thing about these criterion, you know, don't have an out score, there are certain things. Uh, you know, there's a certain thing called cut score. Um, if the individuals meet that certain level, we, we can't get rid of this themselves. Our board exams have to d differentiate, you know, does someone make a certain level or do a certain level themselves? And the criterion doesn't look at that themselves. It's, you know, they're looking at where, we're looking at where in criterion, the level of mastery people should be at. And the score themselves may just say where people are at in relation to other individuals. So again, the criterion is looking beyond that. When we look at clinical skills assessment exams, for example, themselves, you know, we may look at different situations. We may look at how they can apply different procedures or protocols or procedures. We may themselves, which elements of that develop some competence. There are certain critical elements to doing things, and we can evaluate someone to make sure they have those behaviors themselves. And some of these, you know, performance tests, you know, may or not have these cut scores themselves to go through that. A better way to take a look at this is, you know, kind of stepping back and looking at the, again, the psychomotor themselves, you know, in domain, because this is an area where you really have to have individuals that really understand it rather than can just recite things. You want to look at a set standard. Again, how, when you're looking at manipulation and training someone else for manipulative treatment, you know, there's a certain speed, there's precision, there's distance. They understand that three-dimensional concepts of doing things. There may be, you know, those elements going through it. When you're performing any procedure, there are certain elements that we go through to do that. And we have to make sure they can go through those specifically. And can they fulfill that? There are certain high stakes things that we go through as physicians. We have to make sure that we do that. You cannot finish Austin Medical School without passing COMLEX. And understanding the National Board of Austin Medical Examiners, it's been set up basically for the public to ensure that we have competent physicians going through that. We're also trying to train people for the actual practice of osteopathic medicine. And they have to meet these areas, these high state tests, but also when they're, if they get through that, it's beyond it. One comment here is that each patient is a high stakes test. We have to make sure we have people when they're training and they're training and they're taking care of our patients that they're honestly doing a good job and that they are competent physicians. So, maybe kind of step back, let's ask the big question itself. What does it take to be successful in teaching procedural skills? Well, let's look at ATLS. Very common, been around for a period of time, ACLS, other models are doing it. They base models um, and look at studies of them. Uh, George and Dodo did studies and valued the effectiveness of this. They gave an overview. They gave a silent demonstration. Then they'd repeat the process to the learner, but then they'd give details of what they're doing with each step. They'd have the students talk through the skill and then perform the skill. So you can see multiple repetition but keeping that sequence again, because procedures require many times that sequence of events and understanding it. So their success themselves in that feedback going through it go through multiple levels. The ability to do things, their attitude, and develop the psychomotor skills. So what happens, sometimes you get people, and if you're in any learning situation, that they give that kind of deer in the headlights look. And they're going through things, you know, if they're having trouble getting this and understanding it, you know, think about why are they not understanding this? Well, there's a lot of things. There's a whole area of the learner and maybe all the different learning styles and maybe how we demonstrate they're not understanding it through that. Maybe our approach and training in that is fine for a good number of people, but other people they is not adequate and maybe they need to have it demonstrated in a different manner going through it. Many times we're demonstrating that maybe we're following correctly, you may not be the first person who showed us something and maybe the person before didn't exactly show them the right way to do things. Um, and, you know, and they may have been imprinted in the wrong direction and referring to that. Um, and so 
or you know, a technique or approach that is no longer acceptable or doing it. When we're going through and learning things also is that maybe it's not been corrected before or appropriately reinforced to do that. Um, there's you know, other factors with that. And there are many learners that sometimes come through and say they, their perception is they're doing well, uh, but they're not exactly doing well. And it's our responsibility overseeing them to give them that feedback. And, um, and, and that's important. As we know, that the one we call the quadrants of looking at things is knowing, unknowing, competent, and incompetent. And the scary person is the person who is you know, unknowingly not competent. And we have to pick those people out as we're going through things. The next question we look at with this is what are unique considerations in procedural skill acquisition or applying to neuromuscular medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine? And let's look at two different perspectives. Let's look at a perspective of a learner and then it's also think of the perspective of the teacher because each one has different elements that we're looking at and their perspective interact how we're doing it. When we look at the student, we're looking at an individual that may be new to a technique or new to approach or utilizing this. When we look at the instructor, we may have someone that may have expertise, but or you know maybe more of a novice themselves in a procedure. But you know even an expert is not certain. You know what are the best ways to approach and to be effective with this. When you look to the next thing after you look at the perspectives of our learner and ourselves as educators. How do you implement teaching specific techniques to improve their ability to understand specific osteopathic manipulative techniques? And those are things we have to go from. Again, we're trying to look at the Covey thing, look at the end in mind. You know, what is your outcome? What's your final goal? We want to have someone that has developed, you know, competency in the area of osteopathic manipulative treatment. Then we got to look at what is required to meet those standards. This is where we have to look at that evaluation. We can look at that feedback. We also have some concepts of formative and summative. So again, think of this as formative as a safe area in the process of doing things, saying, let's go through this and also tell the learners, this is a low stress situation. I just to make sure that you can perform this technique and approach this. The summative is at the end because we're gonna have a practical to make sure you understand that, which you know puts a little more pressure, but at least they have that end in mind themselves. And we're going to give you feedback throughout the process. So again, that formative procedural testing, you want to make sure they're getting feedback going through it, and you want to give them feedback through the process. You know, and as someone say, you know, you like to hear that do or die situation again with summative assessment, but you know, the idea is they have to demonstrate that they can meet that. You know, at the end. Well, how do you do it? Well, you know, then you look at yourself and your teaching role and going through it. You know, we want to look at people that develop critical thinking. And to do that, we want to reinforce the good things they're doing, and we want to correct things that are, are not there themselves. So an evaluation of feedback, again, we're looking at formative, so as they're going through the process, guiding them, and they had that summative. And that summative means to document that they want to see maintain those skills. And this, again, goes from a school when a student is in their first practical in Oscar Medical School to someone who's in a residency and fellowship or documenting they have clinical skills in osteopathic concepts. Where do we want to go with it? Well, our goal is we want to have competent osteopathic physicians that can diagnose um, and use an appropriate structural exam, understand somatic dysfunction, and comply osteopathic medical treatment that's appropriate to their area themselves. And think of clinical situations that they can add this to in getting that. When you look at requirements in the accreditation standards for our training programs for our schools, they want to look at different things with our osteopathic concepts. They want to look that we can demonstrate that we're utilizing it. We want to show that we're promoting it and, you know, and, and teaching it in different forms and evaluating it to make sure that we're getting through that. Demonstrating it is one area themselves where we can go through and, and just in our actions. Sometimes just the idea that we, for having grand rounds, to say I expect to have some caveat that at least discuss osteopathic concepts associated with that. And that helps with our again, promotion, telling them that this is important. I expect people, you know, this is important part of your curriculum, it's important part of your identity. And we need that the people in the leadership of education to really acknowledge that. And that impacts our whole teaching and to make sure, again, the right tools to evaluate it. And kind of appealing to everyone who is an educator because we have a tremendous responsibility. And how we impact our learners is very important. When we're doing OSPE concepts, and we're teaching osteopathic treatment, 
this is not just here's just a procedure to do. It's honestly a whole modality that's unique to our profession to help and train our patients themselves. And we have to look at different situations that this may be helpful for our patients in going through it. And to think of that. So look at the philosophy behind it and understand why we're doing it and asking why. There are different models that also help us even in very busy clinical situations that help get evidence. The five preceptor, five minute preceptor model is also a wonderful application that we can apply to looking and enhancing osteopathic concepts. You know, again, you look at themselves with the commitment from the learner, you know, what's going on? You pull up supporting evidence, you know, how could osteopathic concepts be here, the why? Teach a general rule, and that's your chance to learn and to give them that general thing about how they're thinking and going through it. If they've done things well, reinforce that and again correct mistakes so they know what not to do. Again, getting beyond just the technique, have them describe the role of the musculoskeletal system in health and disease. So if the patient comes in for heart failure, for example, this would be a good opportunity to say, did you notice any areas of somatic dysfunction that are typically associated with individuals who have cardiac disorders? Oh, you know, picking themselves any alterations of body framework themselves, trauma situations, you know, someone who has low back pain, what has occurred to themselves, um, how's it impacted the patient's well-being and going through that. And then look for the different levels. Again, we're guiding learners, we're starting with novices, we're trying to develop them to be competent, and we want to move them to become, develop expertise. But that first tier is someone coming in and saying, well, describe the indication contraindications to using osteopathic manipulative treatment. Fundamental approach. Once they've got through that first tier, go beyond it, you know, and look at the situation, well, why is OMT really indicated in this setting? Get them to think, to look at that. And let's say themselves, you know, would another modality, you know, not be indicated? So maybe there's a situation where you have a frail uh, person coming in uh, with pneumonia, and you've seen a number of studies that have occurred that have showed that's beneficial, um, but you say you're concerned about the age group using very aggressive techniques. That's a good opportunity to, to work with the learner and say there are other ways you can treat this and other modalities. And go beyond contraindications. You know, is there an absolute contraindication doing that myself? And maybe in their mind they're thinking, well, I just all I know is these very aggressive techniques. And say, no, there's other ways to do it. Those are helpful in certain situations, but not here. So kind of moving the learner beyond themselves. And looking at all the methods. You know, can this clinical situation allow the utilization of multiple OMT methods? You know, so when you may have a patient there in front of you to say, what things can be helpful for this patient and why would this, why would not? So again, you may have a situation where someone is elderly or they may have a relative contraindication to using aggressive manipulative uh, treatment, but they may benefit from you know, other uh, gentle modalities themselves. Or there may be a situation where they're an athlete that you may say, gee, I, in order to be, uh, get more successful outcomes, we should look at using more direct modality to help with this. Um, and you may find learners that may be resistant to doing things and probing on that. Many times it's because our learners are uncomfortable with things. And that's where you can say, you know what, there's many ways to approach this. They'll make people feel bad about that. Say, you know, maybe you're not comfortable with this modality. Well, guess what? There are dozens of manipulative techniques and modalities. Consider using the other ones to help with that. And then, you know, my role is director of medical education. I'm always chasing documents all the time. And so I, I remind our learners all the time, now remember, every patient we're admitting, we're getting a structural exam, aren't we? You know, of course, I know that's not always happening uh, in a real world like that. But to encourage that, but each time let them know it's important and to make sure that they're, they're doing that and, you know, to kind of follow through. Because if you don't kind of insist upon it, you know, learners go to the path of least resistance. And in medical training, it's very busy and uh, themselves. So I think we've got to insist on what we feel is important. And then also, you want to go to the next level himself. Do they demonstrate medical knowledge of the use in different conditions? But not just low back pain or neck or structural problems, but again, that patient who came with heart failure, a patient with pneumonia, and looking beyond just musculoskeletal disorders, and then taking some time to kind of talk about what things we can see in these conditions and going through that to make the learner kind of conscious of that. When you're evaluating yourself, you want to make sure there's an ongoing evaluation. And that is to make sure that first of all, people are performing things and do that through all years of training themselves and skills. 
many times when you have, if you have a course, you know, or you're having even in the midst of residency or students and you're having a class and doing something, having an evaluation form to make sure they're going through and doing things and make sure that they're forming techniques or training to document that they're progressing and also an expectation they should be forming things and, and doing it themselves. Again, making sure it's measurable. A lot of the schools have practicals, which is very helpful. In our postgraduate training programs, we find other methods that are doing that. And also documentation, they're even documenting and doing that and make sure they're keeping logs of things that they're doing. So we've really viewed a lot of concepts in trying to look at procedural skills. Procedural skill training is an essential part of medical education. In osteopathic medical education, we also have the unique procedural skill of osteopathic manipulative treatment in applying that. There are some unique things that we can think about as us, as teachers, in osteopathic medical education that may help us to reinforce this. Really, the key one is really our attitude and our ability to promote that and advocate for it, telling learners this is important and we value it, and to really heighten being an osteopathic physician and what we're about. Um, I'm a huge fan of ne nepotism, so I just have one little uh, kind of ending quote uh, from uh, kind of my kind of greatest mentor. If circumstances limit their therapeutic modalities, and isolate them from the many effective errors, this, uh, remedies of this medical error, they still have their hands, which by their talented maneuvers can return structural integrity and physiological stability to perverted tissues. For those are the hands of an osteopathic physician. And, and my father wrote that in the uh, Oscar Monthly in 1951, and that was a picture when he was an intern at Doctors Hospital in Columbus, uh, but always advocated the, the uh, kind of the power of our hands and what we can do. And our learners have that potential in their hands, and we, as hospital educators, are responsible to help make sure that that goes forward to helping to take care of the patients that uh, we are entrusted to. Thank you.